Next up, we've got uh, Ahmed Garaf. Uh, he returned to Framestore as joint head of CG in 2017 after a brief absent absence working on Star Wars The Last Jedi and Ready Player One as lead effects artist at ILM. Ahmed's Framestore credit lists include major advertising hits such as McDonald's Reindeer Ready, Sainsbury's Mog's Christmas Calamity, and Shell V-Power Shapeshifter. Uh, over to Ahmed to take us through uh, some work at Framestore. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> All right. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming. Uh, thank you for sticking around. Thank you for Chris for, and Side Effects for inviting me along to speak to you all today. Um, as Chris said, my name's Ahmed. I'm one of the heads of CG at Framesaw here in London. Um, and today I'm going to talk to you uh, through some of the creature work that we've done in the department. Um, and I'll explain how we've used Houdini to solve some of the challenges that we've s solved along the way. Um, I'll first start by telling you a little bit about our department. Um, Right, so historically we were mainly a commercials department known for producing some really iconic and memorable adverts, but over the years uh, our department has evolved and has grown exponentially both in, in size and in our offering. So um, we've grown and adapted with the new and emerging technologies and the way people engage with digital content. Um, so we've got three main offerings television's kind of self-explanatory. Uh, immersive, we need a whole other presentation to talk through that. Um, you know, cr creating theme park rides from start to finish to VR and AR experiences. Um, and of course, we're still creating commercials. Um, I'd like to add that this year, we've been fortunate enough to, to have VES nominations in each of our department's offerings, so that's uh, Really, really good achievement that we're all very proud of. Um, all right, so that's enough about the department. Let's move on to our main topic. Um, a few years back, we had the opportunity to um, recreate this classic British character. Her name's Mog. Um, it's kind of a stylized, cartoony cat, if, if <coughs> no one's familiar with it. Uh, the spot was three and a half minutes long, and it featured this fat cat. Um, when the job was first awarded, uh, we had big discussions among the team about how we were going to rig and deform this cat. And the, the more we talked through it, the, the more I was convinced that we should be simulating as, as much of the surface of the cat as we can. Uh, it's this big blubbery cat and you know, you, there's only so much you can do with blend shapes. Um, a few of the guys argued that we should spend more time adding more sophisticated rig controls, uh, belly controls, so the animators can move it around and all of that stuff. But I, I wasn't convinced. Um, in, in my mind's eye, you know, a, a real cat can't animate its belly this way or that way, right? That's that's all driven by physics. Um, so that's that's the road I wanted to go down. Um, and around the same time, luckily for us, Houdini had just shipped with this uh, brilliant new solver, the FEM solver, and I was really keen to try it out as it was, uh, it seemed like a very good way to simulate fleshy and fatty materials. Um, so for me, seeing this simulation was really exciting um, for, for many reasons. <laughs> I, I did this test really early on in the project, just kind of as a as a proof of concept, just to, to make sure that what I had in my head would, would actually work. Um, so I wanted to create an FEM volume, uh, which had an inner skeleton, and have that skeleton drive everything ar uh, else around it. So that's that's essentially what we've got here, right? We've, we've got this uh, animator tube that's just kind of bobbing up and down, uh, which can represent our skeleton. And then we have the sphere that's wrapped around it and all the points that the tube is is uh, intersecting with the sphere that's uh, just constrained on you hit simulate and you let it go and it does some really fun stuff um, and because it's in Houdini you know you can manipulate everything to a, a finite level so you, you know you can change the properties on a per ted basis giving more, more control over the behavior and introducing some randomizations, etc., to give it a, a more organic look. 
Uh, here's a bit more testing, some early R&D. Um, I, I don't know if you can see it on the screen. There's uh, some, some green points along the, the front and the back. So what, what, what you can't see is then an, an invisible skeleton that's kind of driving that simulation. So the, the same as the clip that I showed you earlier. There's a skeleton that's animated, um, that's intersect intersecting with the geometry, and that's driving the simulation. Everything else is, is just driven by the FEM physics. And I've, I've added a bouncing brick in there just for fun. Uh, here you can see a side-by-side -side comparison of what's coming um, straight from rigging on, on the far side and once it's gone through um, the FEM solver. Uh, so you can see it gives us a lot more kind of organic deformation um, as well as volume preserving. Uh, and because of this, on this particular project, our rigging team just didn't really have to think about skinning the character much at all. Um, you know, the sp spending time painting complicated skin weights and cr clusters and all, all of that kind of stuff. So it freed them up to spend more time on the actual mechanics of the rig uh, to create something that's really good and robust for the, for the animators to work with. Um, so during the project, we created this uh, fun little um, animation tests, which kind of evolved and changed over over the breadth of the project. Um, uh, initially, we used it internally just for testing all aspects of of the asset. You know, modeling, the rigging, testing the animation, shaders, look dev, all of that stuff. Uh, but we also used it to present a client that something uh, that was a bit more fun than you just standard turntable, just a you know classic static model spinning around. Um, here we can see that same animation, just with the FEM sim running on top of it. It's a bit creepy. Um, as, as you can see, we, we ended up simulating much, much more of the cat than, say, compared to the, the test with the bouncing brick that you guys saw earlier. Um, the more we ran shots and the more we did tests, I just kind of slowly, slowly started encroaching on more of the character and until we're pretty much simulating everything except the the tail the paws and the face and ears uh, we were even simulating the cheeks up here which gave us some really nice secondary animation uh, here's another fun clip <laughs> uh, i must admit I, I turned the settings up uh, just for a bit of a giggle uh, but i mean the uh, the intention was um, really um, all right, l l let me backtrack. As I mentioned earlier, the, the spot was three and a half minutes long, um, and we had a lot of shots for in, that, that had this cat in it. And we had a very, very small CFX team on, on, the, on the project, i.e. just me. So um, I wanted to, to create this automated system. I, I didn't want to uh, go into every shot and run simulations and update caches and all of that stuff. So I wanted to automate as much as possible. Uh, I had this one master scene, which I updated throughout the production. Um, and that was triggered on the farm at the end of each animation cache coming out of Maya. This then simulated these CFX components, including some first simulation. Um, and at the end of that, it spat out a couple of QC renders, one with uh, some really cheap fur and one of just the skin, so we can see the, the how the skin is moving and deforming. Um, and that cut out you know, a, a whole process of an animator creating a cache and going up to a lighter and saying, hey, I've got a cache, can you push it through and, and render it. So this, you know, it was, it was really good and, and liberating for, for everyone on the team. Um, and I also gave some control over to the, to the animators. Again, like I say, I was just a, a one-man team um, and I didn't want to uh, animate things that I uh, didn't, didn't really have time to do it. So I created this squishiness attribute, which was exposed in the Maya rig. Um, which the animators can animate uh, within their shot. So, you know, if the cat is moving fast and running around, then they can tighten it up and all the skin would, would come together. If it's sitting down on the table or if it's relaxed, they can increase the squishiness and just kind of let, let its flab settle a little bit. Um, uh, 
we got here. So here's one of those QC renders I was telling you about. Um, this is actually one of my favorite shots. I love the animation on her face, and uh, that same animation is accentuated by, you can see the, as, as her face is getting squished against her arms, her, her cheeks are getting squished like that. And that's coming purely from the simulation, which, which was great. Um, we didn't have to do blend shapes and all of that complicated stuff. And here's a snippet from the final project. <laughs> Next up is uh, a project that we did a couple of years back for Mercedes. Um, we were tasked with uh, creating this photoreal lion's head, which we then tracked onto um, this high-powered alpha male businessman. Um, previously, we'd used in-house fur tools for all our grooming needs, uh, which was developed by the film department. Um, but around this time that we were uh, awarded this project, Houdini 16 had just released uh, with this whole new set of fur tools which we were very keen to try out. Um, very quickly we found that the new fur system was very powerful for the simple fact that it was in Houdini, uh, you know, meaning it was all node-based, it was all procedural, data can be manipulated anywhere and transferred as you want in the scene, helping us create exactly the results that we needed. Uh, so for instance, we, it was possible to create some really intricate subclumps and fine-tune how the fur looked uh, to create realistic shapes and, and variations. Um, one of the biggest challenges that we faced uh, was dealing with complex fur simulations and collisions. Uh, we had a couple of shots where the the guy was passing his hands through his hair, and you know that's that that kind of that kind of stuff is quite tricky. Um, of course, we were using the wire solver, which was wrapped up into the into the fur tools at the time. And you know, for those of you who've used the wire solver, you know that it can be quite fickle. Um, eventually, with enough sub steps, uh, tickling the right parameters, and a few secret handshakes, we uh, we managed to get a sim that worked. Um, so here's the intermediate render of the same thing that you saw. There you go. We can see some hands intersecting with the fur. Um, and here's the final thing. changing technology at the touch of one button. Um, next.
next up, I'm going to talk about this project that we did for a Sony A7 camera. Um, so earlier last year, we um, delivered this project. And we were tasked for, uh, with creating this herd of black wildebeest running at super slow motion. Um, initially, when we uh, got the script and we awarded the project, the, our main task was to um, embellish some live action plates. So we were going to go out on a shoot and actually capture lots of footage of these um, wild wildebeest running around in super slow motion with phantom cameras and all of that stuff. And we were going to add in some extra CG wildebeest just to bolster the herb, maybe some close-ups of like hooves landing and that kind of stuff. Uh, so we went out on the shoot uh, to shoot the wildebeest, not with a gun, but with a camera. Um, and they they weren't there. We turned up, and the guy that that owns the ranch, he was like, "Oh yeah, all the all the wildebeest are pregnant. They're miles and miles away. We can't get anywhere near them. Sorry, uh, here's an empty field." Uh, so suddenly, while we're on shoot, the brief completely changed and you know the the client still wanted to have this this idea the the, the black wildebeest running at super slow motion uh, so we had to think of really kind of quick and efficient ways to to still deliver the brief um, I mean we we still had to create the wildebeest anyway but we needed to build it in a much more kind of full frame type of way um, here here are a, a couple of breakdowns uh, of the shots. So the premise of the ad is uh, this famous footballer guy is out on safari taking pictures with his brand new A7 camera and the pictures that he's taken are so detailed and so sharp that he's uh, transported into this dreamlike state where he can walk through the herd and into the picture in, in super slow motion. Um, each shot essentially ended up being kind of close to a still image where our uh, CG renders were moving at around 4,000 frames a second. Uh, so here's an, um, so our animator created this extended run cycle, uh, or a, a range of motion, if you will, uh, which we then used and, and stretched out to 4,000 frames a second. And within Houdini, we created this kind of fake uh, crowd system. It's uh, you know just a simple point instancing where you can uh, scatter points around and you choose exactly the the point along the the run cycle where you want it to 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 have on the screen. Um, of course, these characters had uh, really long flowing tails, so we had to create some fur simulations because uh, the director on this commercial was constantly making changes to the layout of the herd uh, up, up to the up to the last day and adjusting which parts of the run cycle which uh, were being used by which wildebeest on which part of the screen we never really knew which um, parts of the run cycle we were going to see in the final image which meant we had to create a, a first simulation for the entirety of of the run cycle um, but there was no way I was going to simulate at 4,000 frames a second. I, it, it would have meant I would have uh, been simulating at over 24,000 frames, uh, which is just crazy. Um, so after some experimentations, um, I settled on simming at around 250 frames a second, which you know, it had enough detail and subsets um, that allowed me to, to time stretch it. And then I added some extra noise and deformations and post presses and that kind of stuff to just add a bit more interesting look to the final image. Um, I also like to render my test renders with uh, bright neon colors just for fun. Uh, speaking of bright neon, uh, when we delivered the job, we were trying to think up of a cool way to present our work that we'd done. Uh, this this shot is is it's nothing to do with the commercial. This was just kind of a, a bit of fun that we that we did internally. Uh, so we had this fun run cycle, which um, we created with the intention of only being viewed at super slow motion. So you, you know, I'm I'm sure you can spot some clicks and pops and that kind of stuff, but we, we didn't care. It was, this was just for, for us in, internally for fun. Um, 
around the same time that the project delivered, uh, the Eurovision Song Contest had, had just aired. Uh, I don't know if any of you are, are familiar with that. But uh, anyway, uh, one of the acts apparently had uh, some really impressive stage lighting, which inspired uh, Grant Walker, our co-head of CG, to, to recreate them in CG. Uh, using a bit of chops and Houdini, we put together the slideshow for, for our wildebeest to run through. Um, all right, last up is uh, this commercial that we recently delivered uh, just before Christmas last year. Uh, it was for McDonald's. Uh, we were tasked with creating six different reindeer to fly Santa around for the night while he delivered presents and ate lots of mince pies. Um, we had about... Uh, three and a half to four months to, to deliver close to 40 shots of um, full CG reindeer. Um, and apart from creating the reindeer, we, were, you know, we also had to create all kinds of volumetric effects and um, uh, you know, they, they've got this rigging around them and uh, all, all kinds of other stuff, but I won't touch on that too much today. Um, right, so we kicked off with one of the most important things, if not the most important things, when creating a, a creature in CG, or, or creating anything in CG for that matter. Uh, collecting and studying reference. So, I, I firmly believe that in order to recreate something from, from scratch for us in CG, we should try to, to understand and study as much of uh, what we're trying to create as possible. Uh, so we steeped ourselves in reference. We, we visited a farm where we spent uh, some time hanging out with some reindeer, uh, feeding them, stroking them, uh, taking lots of pictures. Um, we had a TV mounted up in our office that was just constantly looping through clips and pictures of reindeer. We were just like reindeer crazy. Um, in pre-production, we started by creating some sketches and concept designs which slowly evolved and uh, changed and you know hel helped us answer some of the the broader questions very early on like size and shape of the reindeer the color the mechanics of how they're all going to attach to the sleigh um, and how many reindeer we were going to have this was this was a, a hot debate at one point uh, within the office should ha santa have six reindeer or should Sound to have eight reindeer. It was, it was a bit divisive, but we, we ended up with six, thankfully. It would have been too heavy on our render farm otherwise. Um, it was important to figure out a lot of this stuff uh, before we got into to creating the, the assets, and pre production for me is, is, is always quite a fun stage. Um, so, Right from the start, we knew that we wanted to leverage Houdini as much as we can with uh, the data coming out of Maya. Um, so we um, decided to use FBX exports. Um, it, it was easy enough to get our animated joints out of Maya and into Houdini. Uh, and then we had our full skeleton rig, and we used that as our basis for um, driving a lot of the, the character stuff. Um, so using that, that same FBX skeleton that you just saw, we built a, a Houdini muscle rig around it. It was our first foray into using Houdini muscles, um, and there was a, a lot of learning to be had. Uh, we, we ended up using just the, the simple jiggle controls to get uh, momentum and movement into the muscles rather than using full dynamic simulations at, at that stage due to certain bugs that we discovered um, and time constraints as well. What, what this gave us was, was good enough for what we needed. Um, we then wrapped those muscles up in a FEM solid embed object um, to get more physically accurate simulation. Uh, so this this approach is it's not too dissimilar to what we saw on Mog the the fat cat earlier. Um, it's it's kind of an evolution of of that process. Uh, it's just slightly more sophisticated. So we we've got before where we just had uh, a skeleton driving everything. Now we had a skeleton which was driving some muscles, and those muscles had attributes and parameters which were then driving the the FEM on top of that. Um, and then on top of that simulation, 
uh, we sometimes added another layer of detail to certain shots and some some of the foreground characters. Um, so using the the new hybrid object, which um, has recently become available to us, uh, we were added to add some fine wrinkles and detailing in the skin, like uh, skin sliding and and whatnot. Uh, so on to grooming. Uh, the fur groom was one of the biggest challenges for us uh, from both an artistic and a technical point of view. Uh, the approach for creating the base guides relied quite heavily on manual combing and masking. So um, combing and sculpting each of the guides, adding curvature, volumes and flow, uh, just carefully to, to each section of the reindeer. We, we had very specific reference that we were honing in on and we, we were looking for, the, for, for exact sh shapes and, and flow. So it's, you know, manual combing is, is, was essentially one of the only ways for us to, to achieve that. I know it's a slightly destructive workflow to be sure, uh, but at this stage, it allowed for a level of detail control which would be very difficult to achieve procedurally. Um, right. So after sculpting the base guides, we moved on to then we moved on to a more procedural workflow. Um, so relying on several levels of subclumps, uh, we used our uh, sculpted guys to to generate the first layer of subhairs, um, just to kind of initialize the system. This also dictates the overall clump size. Uh, a second layer of subhairs, uh, which is denser than the first one, is then clumped on top of that, and and so on. You know, it, it's it's an iterative process. You can just kind of keep honing in on as many subclumps as you need. Um, different noises are obviously applied along the way to kind of break up the clumps and add some more details and naturalistic looks. Um, here's uh, more of the same thing. You can see it's, uh, yeah, that's the sculpted guy, some subclumps and some extra subclumps. Uh, here are a few uh, whip groom renders. So adding small details like clumps along the mouth to simulate the, the wet fur and breaking the symmetry along the face and the foreheads all helped uh, to add to the, to the realism. Um, we had some really close up uh, shots of the, the reindeer where the camera was going to get very, very close to the eye and, and, and the muzzle. Uh, so we had to make sure that our assets would would hold up to the camera getting so close. So uh, you know, we, we we did the same thing. We stuck cameras all over the the asset, and we'd we'd hone in and we'd scrutinize and and add in as much details as we can. You can see us. Uh, so yeah, when whenever we're presenting renders, we're we're always chucking the reference in there so you, you've you've always got a frame of reference like this is the real one this is our cg one what what does the real one have that ours doesn't and you know constantly iterating constantly just comparing and and, and trying to hone in on on what nature just creates by itself um right so in real life reindeer grow furry antlers around uh kind of late spring um they actually grow the the antlers at a, at an astonishing rate. The when after the the antlers fall off and they're growing them again, they they grow at about an a, an inch a day, which is crazy. Um, and then around August time, that furry layer of skin begins to to rub and and peel off, and it can look pretty gruesome with like blood dripping down the antlers and down onto its face. It's, there's them, yeah, we, we saw some crazy pictures. Um, either way, by December time and Christmas, um, generally the real reindeer, the, the antlers uh, would completely uh, lose their fuzz or they would have fallen off altogether. Uh, but, you know, for this project, we decided to take some creative and artistic license. Uh, you know, ev everyone likes a bit of furry, Furry antlers, so we decided that our reindeer were going to have furry antlers. And, you know, who's to say that Santa's reindeer aren't a different breed of reindeer that keep furry antlers throughout the year? That's, that's, uh, so we had six different antlers to make fuzzy. 
but e for each one of them, um, because the the shapes varied differently, the, the we didn't have the same topology. Um, so the, the, there was a bit of a, a, a manual process just to get the the grooms on on all of them. But since the fur was quite short and messy, uh, just using curve flows to draw draw directly on on the geometry uh, proved kind of a, a very effective and quick way to draw the different meshes. So adding extra parting lines helped to add more details, um, along with some procedural noise. After establishing the workflow and, and deciding on, on the look of one of the antlers, it was uh, pretty straightforward to recreate it on, on all the other ones. It's like a fitting minute job. Um, so this this for me was one of the one of the most interesting parts of the job. Um, so while studying reindeer, we noticed that um, the different coloured hairs generally had different properties in length and density and thickness and and so on. And you know, d depending if it summertime or winter time, they they generally had a different groom. Uh, so we decided that. Um, when it came to texturing the reindeer, we would draw on on um, ha how it is in the natural world. So we we uh, we decided this new approach where that we'd not tried before. Um, it was a bit experimental, but we were confident that we were onto something that would work and would add a, a, a really good extra level of realism. Um, so instead of painting color maps in kind of a, a traditional manner and say Mari or Photoshop or whatever, uh, we decided to drive everything using painted attributes directly in Houdini. The color attributes um, initially were linked to the hair generator. So we had hair gens for each of the different color types and each of the different fur types on the reindeer. Um, it turned out that the uh, painting those color mounts were, uh, it was actually a quite a, a fast way compared to the traditional uh, way of painting textures, because that's one thing we were worried about. We we're like, is this, uh, are we going down the r right route? Is this going to add extra time? But actually, in, in retrospect, it was much, much quicker. Uh, especially when we had to create six different color pa uh, patterns for for uh, each each of our six reindeer. Um, so yeah, you can see here there's uh, different different combinations and different masks allowed us to to mix between the different types and the different colors of hair uh, pretty quickly. Um, here's an early turntable render of one of our reindeer. Uh, we use Arnold. Um, we, we we predominantly use Arnold in the department. We we do use Mantra for for some of the the projects, but we ri rely heavily on Arnold. Um, and so the the same attributes that that I was talking about earlier that we painted for for the different types of fur, we use those exact same attributes to drive the the melanin attribute in the in the Arnold fur shader. Uh, so again. We, we're not driving anything by color. It's it's all driven by attributes, um, which, you know, in, in in the real world, your your hair color comes from melanin, un unless you're dyeing your hair purple or green or uh, anything else. You know, it's 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 a natural occurring thing. So the the more we look to nature to to help us drive what we what we're doing, I think the the more realistic our our um, CG renders will be. Uh, that's uh, a close-up of the reindeer. Um, again, I mean, it, you know, uh, g going back to looking at some of the, the previous creatures that, that, that I showed earlier, say Marg or the wildebeest or, or the lion, uh, w w whenever we zoom in on a, on a close-up of the face and stuff, the, the fur usually has this kind of painterly look and you can see where the colors are, are blending in, in, in between between each other, but we just we, we didn't struggle with that at all in, in this project f for the simple fact that we just relied on driving everything through attributes and, and melanin. Uh, <laughs> right, next up, fur sims. Uh, so fur sims for us was, uh, is, it was quite a, a sticking point. 
Um, I, ideally for me, um, I want um, an FX artist or a, or a CFX artist to, to simulate the fur guides, uh, approve those and then pass those over to whoever's going to be li lighting the creature, the, get the, the deformed guides, that get the static groom, that add them together, everything would deform and y you'd have some really cool renders. Um, you know, and and there there is an option for that uh, to do that in Houdini in the guide deform. You know, you, you can capture the the guides and and use that further down the line in in the guide deform. But um, c certainly for the number of hairs that we were working with, capturing the guides at uh, fur generation time, it just it, it it wasn't working. It was out endless hours and hours and hours and uh, memory limits and all sorts of stuff. Um, we just couldn't do it, and even when we trimmed the fur down, so thinking, all right, let's let's do it in chunks. Once we got into the guide deform stage, the deformations were just were, were not as clean as we wanted. Uh, you know, guides were affecting some fur that it shouldn't have been. Um, so we gave, eventually gave up on that, and um, we were just simulating the fur directly in you know in in the hair gens and generating full fur caches of just the parts of the reindeer that we wanted simulated um, and it looks really weird <laughs> they, they kind of look like Amish reindeer I always thought um, so that's that's what we did we just you know eventually we ended up going right we'll just simulate the longest hairs the bits that interacted with the um, with the harness, um, um, the, you know, the, the harness was simulated as well. We, we used uh, the bullet solver to, to do that. Um, but yeah, first simulations. Uh, so off, off the back of that, I mean, you know, we, we did what we can. After some grafting, we, we, we got the first sims out. But uh, looking to the future, um, We've uh, recently hired in a really clever guy to help us with uh, some R&D work. He's, he's sitting in the crowd and has been asking some really poignant questions. Uh, he's, he's been back and forth with Kai and uh, he's, he's essentially created uh, a new guide deform for us at, at Framesaw, which, which we're using and it's, and it's super fast and efficient and it does exactly what we want. Um, and he's now, um, he's, he's also created an, an, a new, um, new way of uh, grooming the fur, which again is, is faster and next up for us, we're, we're starting to, to look at some feathery stuff. So, you know, maybe next presentation we can talk about that. Um, anyway, so here's the final result. And now, Sky One presents from McDonald's. No carrots again. I'm afraid that's it. Thank you very much.
Any questions? <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> Beautiful work, by the way. Um, uh, thank you, and yeah. kudos to uh, the team that, that worked on, uh, a lot of them are in the audience, so thank you guys. Um, I was wondering, when you said you were painting maps for the reindeer, for the color, mm -hmm. how did you deal with the root and the tip? And then also I noticed some kind of random variance between the like browns, close up browns and whites. How, how did you deal with that? Um, uh, root to tip was, was uh, dealt with uh, at a shader level. Um, w when we were mixing between the the, the colors, so we uh, essentially we said, all right. So uh, let's say, for example, uh, white fur is going to be zero point two five. Uh, brown fur is going to be zero point five. Um, gray fur is going to be one. And then we we paint in that. Uh, we uh, mix and, and blend the colors and we normalize that so any anything that's that's in between just just picks one of the colors basically so you, you never you never really get a blend between the two it's it's either going to be uh, brown or white or, or white or brown Hello. Hi, uh, how long did it take to to do the grooming of the reindeer? Like, how long did it take the whole thing to be done? Um, Not the simulation part, just the grooming, the uh, drawing the guides uh, and, and doing all that. That's a good question. Roughly? Was, uh, roughly. How was your ten weeks? Yeah, d uh, about ten weeks. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, okay. Simon. Other questions? <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Good. Thank you. Thanks, Mike.